This is part 5 of the Iron Islands. In part 4, I talked about the decline of the Ironborn, the mainland deciding they've had enough of their shenanigans and forcing them out of many territories, and most importantly, Euron Redhand at the end of the Age of Heroes, who decided he was going to be king without a king's moot. When the priests of the Drowned God decided, heck no, we're going to vote, and tried to convene a king's moot to decide the new king, Redhand and his axemen killed 13 Salt and Rock kings and half a hundred priests and prophets, and officially made himself king of the Iron Islands. In doing this, he successfully ended the king's moot and set his house to rule for hundreds of years. At this time, the Great Irons were already considered one of the oldest and most renowned great houses of the Iron Islands. During the time of the King's Moot, no fewer than 38 Grey Irons had been given a Driftwood crown. That is twice as many High Kings than any other house. But Red Hand ended the era of Driftwood crowns with his slaughter at the King's Moot, and from then on out, descendants of his line didn't need to vote to be decided King, and they styled themselves the King of the Iron Islands and wore black iron crowns that passed from father to son. But Red Hand's actions at the King's Moot had some far-reaching consequences. Galen Whitestaff had forbade the Ironborn from making war on each other. But when the Grey Irons decided the Iron Islands were theirs by right and they wouldn't be taken away, that all changed. The Grey Irons decided that there would be no more Rock Kings or Salt Kings something maesters believe were part of the Ironborn history since they settled the islands. So instead of allowing the tradition of rock and salt kings to remain on the islands, they reduced them to lords, and those that resisted were quickly put down. This resulted in several ancient lines who refused to kneel becoming extinct. This Ironborn on Ironborn fighting would continue, and Red Hand and his successors would deal with half a dozen major rebellions, and at least two major Thrall uprisings over the centuries that followed. Besides infighting, the mainlanders, still a little sore from the kicking the Ironborn had given them centuries before, decided to keep pushing back against them while their islands were in disunity. As the mainlanders pushed back against the Ironborn, the Ironborn's remaining footholds on the mainland were lost. The biggest slap in the face to the Ironborn was the loss of the Misty Islands. King Garth VII, the Golden Hand, King of the Reach, managed to drive the Ironborn from the islands, renamed them the Shield Islands, and resettled them with his own fiercest warriors and finest seamen to defend the mouth of the Mander. The Ironborn decline continued and then hastened when the Andals invaded Westeros some 6,000 years before the beginning of the books. The Andals were different than the First Men, the majority of which weren't seafarers. The Andals were definitely seafarers. They had long ships of their own that were as good as any Ironborn could build, and on top of that, they were fearless at sea. As the Andals pushed through the Riverlands, the Westerlands, and the Reach, they created new villages, walled towns, and stone and timber castles along the coast on every cove and harbor. As well, great lords and petty kings began building warships to defend their shores and shipping. All of this made it that much harder for the Ironborn to reeve. It was only a matter of time before the Andals made their way to the Iron Islands, conquering and intermarrying with ancient families. And this is where Red Hand, again, screwed the Iron Islands. With the decree that Ironborn couldn't attack each other gone, the Ironborn began to scheme against each other. They joined forces with the waves of Andal adventurers to attack different parts of the islands. And the Andals both destroyed and intermarried with the Ironborn families in their conquest of the islands. Had they worked together, could they have held off the Andals? Maybe, but not likely. It was the Andals that brought an end to House Grey Iron. The last Iron King was Ragnar II, who was betrayed by his own people and his house destroyed when the Orkwoods, Drums, Whores, and Grey Irons joined up with a host of Andal pirates, sellswords, and warlords to end their line. After the destruction of the Grey Irons, they couldn't decide who should now rule the Iron Islands, so, and this is a very Ironborn thing to do, they decided they would settle the matter by dancing the Finger Dance. The Finger Dance is a popular game on the islands where players spin a throwing axe at one another and attempt to catch it in the air. Among the competitors, it was Harus Hor who emerged as the victor, but he lost two fingers and was thereafter called Harus Stumphand. He would rule the Iron Islands for 30 years. But I do have to add that the Maesters, the eternal killjoys, 
believe that the story of Harris winning the Iron Islands by catching an axe is just an ironborn story, and that most likely he was chosen because he had taken an Andal maiden for his wife and won the support of many powerful Andal lords. So began the reign of House Hor. These kings were black of hair, black of eye, and black of heart. Their enemies would also claim their blood was black, darkened by Andal taint, as many early Hor kings took Andal maidens as wives. The priests also weren't too happy with the whores ruling the islands, claiming the true Ironborn had salt in their veins and the black-blooded whores were false kings, ungodly usurpers who must be cast down. Many would try to do just that, and all failed. The whores, though lacking in valor, had plenty of cruelty and cunning. Few loved them, but many feared them and their wrath. And here's some of the cheerful names they had. Orthagar the Solus, Orthagar the Demon Lover, Craghorn the Red Smile. Guess why on that one? Horgan the Priest Killer, who I'm guessing didn't win points with the priests of the Drowned God, Feargon the Fierce, and Wolfgar the Widowmaker. Such lovely names. But were the whores that bad? Well, like our world, racism and religious intolerance might have had a hand in their reputation. Their house was fairly tolerant of other religions, especially given they had Andal blood in them, a people that worshipped the Seven. Under House Horror, the faith of the Andals, the faith of the Seven, came to the Iron Islands for the first time. Maesters believe all the talk of the whores having black blood and being demon worshippers is simply religious intolerance and anger over them allowing another religion to enter the islands. And boy did the priests try to rile up the rest of the Ironborn over this. With the Andal queens of the islands pushing their kings to grant septas and septons their protection and leave them to preach around the Iron Islands, the priests of the Drowned God gritted their teeth and grumbled a bit. When the first sep on the Iron Islands was built on Great Wick during Wolfgar the Widowmaker, the gritting and grumbling got worse. When Widowmaker's great-grandson, Horgon, allowed the building of another sept on Old Wick, where the King's Moot in the past had been held, the priests couldn't take it anymore and managed to goad the Ironborn into a rebellion. The entire island of Old Wick rose up and burned the sept, pulling the sept into pieces and dragging the worshippers of the Seven into the sea to be drowned so that they could regain their faith. And because extreme actions always end well, in retaliation for this act, Horgon Hor began to slaughter priests of the Drowned God. And if all that wasn't bad enough, the Horrors also made changes the Ironborn didn't like. They discouraged the practice of reaving, and in the wake of that, trade grew. This was especially good as the Ironborn didn't have the strength anymore to take the resources that they needed, wherever they found it, such as wood to build more ships. There was also a wealth of iron ore on Great Wick, Orkmont, Arlal, and Pike, along with lead and tin that was readily available for trade with the mainlanders. Instead of raiding, the whores used iron ore as a coin to buy wheat, turnips, and barley to keep the small folk fed. But they of course kept the beef and pork for their own tables. The new practice of using iron ore to pay for things brought a new meaning to paying the iron price, which should have been a good thing, but was actually something many ironborn found humiliating and the priest shrieked that it was shameful. Unfortunately, this shame and humiliation only got worse for the Ironborn. The height of their loss of pride and power happened during the reign of the three Harmons, remembered as Harmon the Host, Harmon the Haggler, and Harmon the Handsome. First, Harmon the Host ruled the Iron Islands and was known to be literate. As the Ironborn considered literacy for weak or magic users, he wasn't winning points there. It wasn't the best thing to be known for. Harmon the Host welcomed traders and travelers from all over the known world to his castle on Great Wick. He treasured books and gave septons and septas his protection. His son Harmon the Haggler, who spent his youth as a ward of House Lannister, also had his father's love of reading and became a great traveler, being the first king of the Iron Islands to visit the mainland without a sword in his hand. He also took Lady Lilia Lannister a daughter of the King of the Rock and the fairest flower of the West for his queen. He also, later in life, visited Highgarden and Old Town to treat with their lords and kings and to foster trade. As well, Harmon the Haggler's sons were raised in the faith or his version of it. And I want to talk about his version of the faith really quick because I find it a bit interesting what he tried to do. So Harmon the Haggler believed that the Seven were the true gods, but he also chose to worship and honor the Drowned God. On his return to the Iron Islands, he openly spoke of the Eight Gods, and decreed that a statue of the Drowned God should be at the door of every set. This didn't make either side happy. The priests of the Drowned God didn't want their god next to false gods, 
and the Septons of the Faith of the Seven felt the same way. So in the end, Harmon the Haggler took back his decree and declared that God did in fact only have seven faces, and that the drowned god was an aspect of the stranger. So one of the seven, not an eighth separate god. After his death, his son Harmon the Handsome came to the throne and enacted some changes that the Ironborn also didn't like. Some believe the changes were influenced by his Lannister mother, which didn't help them take the changes any better. First, he announced that from now on, the Reavers would be hanged as pirates instead of celebrated, which was a pretty big blow to the way of life the Ironborn had held in high esteem. As I said in part one, Reavers were placed higher than their fishermen, who basically kept the islands alive with their fishing. Reaving and paying the iron price was a big deal, and still is a big deal to modern iron islands, and this was just a punch to the gut. But Harmon the Handsome didn't stop there. He also made it illegal to take salt wives, and declared the children of these unions were bastards, with no rights of inheritance. So now he took away a custom that was basically the Ironborn's way of, well, for one, getting more than one piece of ass legally without their rock wives freaking out, but two, taking away how they showed their status, power, and ugh, manliness. Harmon the Handsome was about to end the practice of thraldom as well when a priest known as the Shrike finally decided Harmon was done and began to preach against him. Soon, other priests joined him in preaching against Harmon the Handsome, and the lords of the islands began to rise up against him as well. Of all the people on the Iron Islands, only the Septons and their followers stood by King Harmon. But that wasn't enough, and in a fortnight, he was overthrown. Interestingly, his overthrow was almost done bloodlessly, until the priests that originally started preaching against him got to the deposed king. Shrike tore out the king's tongue so that he might never again speak lies and blasphemies. He also blinded the man and cut off his nose so that all men might see him for the monster he is. In Harmon's place, his younger brother Hygon was crowned by the lords and priests, and what resulted was what I can only call a shit show. And we'll talk about that shit show in part six. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up, it keeps me from having another mental breakdown, and come back for more Game of Thrones, Star Wars, comics, and things that make me happy.